All good true crime shows start with a 911 call and usually some type of police response. In 2020, Sarah Boone was engaged in an intense game of hide and seek. Unfortunately, her boyfriend became lost back. We're going to unpack the Sarah Boone suitcase case with an update. All that and what it means for your weekend on the Comp Center. Today in the Comm Center, John and I are manning baggage carousel number 911, which is where the truth comes out after gate arrival. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the fact that Sarah Boone uh, zipped her boyfriend up in his yeah, ears. Yeah, that's claimed not about was, me. Yeah, claimed it was a... Um, a uh, well, we could... we could. She tells it all in the 911 call. If you wanted to play that, we could play yeah, that. She, go for it. Let's go back to the 911 call. 911, what is the location of your emergency? 4748 France Court, apartment 3. 4748, what's the street name? France, F R A N T Z. And the apartment number? 3. Is this a police or medical? My boyfriend is dead. Oh. Okay, send the line for the fire department. Do not hang up. So, both. Fire rescue at the location, Murphy. Desk 32. No, please don't leave. 4748 France Lane, apartment 3, France Court. When she yells, no, please don't leave, I thought this was going to turn into a Halloween episode. Where Who's she talking to? Yeah. Who the hell's I there? Think that's her ex-husband. Oh, yeah. I remember from the body cam. I remember she's got her ex husband there. That's who now, shows up. Then. This woman's having a genuine emergency, whether she it's at her hands or not, and she's saying that I'm a, I'm on France Court, and you're a nine one one dispatcher. I was a nine one one dispatcher. I, 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 you know, I was a cop for a while. Uh, you you worked at a Target as well in uh, theft prevention. Bet your ass. So you you you're used to the audible cues or clues that people give you, and when somebody says that they're on France Court, how do you spell that, John? That's ex- well, as a dispatcher, that's something you have to check on. But I, I would yeah. assume that she meant France, like the country, F R A N C E. But that's not what she's saying, right? And and she's so used to saying it, and she's used just like most nine one one callers, as you'll probably agree with me. They're used to us <laughs> assuming that w- everyone knows where they are. I don't know. It, it it was weird that she's like, "Don't go anywhere," and I was thinking, "Man, this is taking an odd turn. This guy's been raised from the dead." and stumbling away or maybe he's rolling away in the in the suitcase if it had casters yes okay is this near mckenzie drive i don't know where that is okay it's Gilwood park apartments okay four seven four eight france correct correct all right great now tell me exactly what happened there uh, my boyfriend and I were playing last night, and mm-hmm. I put him in a case when we were playing, and okay. like kind of hide and seek kind of thing. So I fell asleep, and I woke up, and he was dead in the suitcase. So I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. Right, okay, what's your apartment number? Three. Um, I don't know. Apartment three. Yes, like he has like blood coming out of his mouth, and I don't know if like he had like an aneurysm or what happened. Uh-huh. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. Listen, we're getting help purple. out there too. All right. Yeah, he's purple. One thing that's uh, interesting about this nine one one call is that a lot of nine one one callers believe that uh, even if they were the perpetrator, if they were the first ones to call, if they get their word in first, that they will be beyond suspicion because they're the ones who took right action and called. Uh, Drew will tell you, as someone who has uh, investigated many horrific crimes, domestic violence crimes, and as someone with many loves that can now not be located, that it is always the the the, the person, uh, the romantic partner that's usually uh, responsible for 
uh, a death or an injury or something like that. It's, it's always it's always the husband, it's always the wife, the boyfriend, the girlfriend. But for some reason, even on domestic violence calls where people are still alive, uh, the the perpetrator will call in first to kind of get on record first, and he thinks that that primacy effect is going to remove him from suspicion. <laughs> yeah, and then and then second of all, I think um, she's. Uh, I think some of the verbal cues that you you could go back and listen to to hear is that she's very direct about everything except. So she's very direct about my husband's in a suit or my boyfriend's in a suitcase. I he's dead. He's dead in a suitcase. She's got the address down. She's got the apartment complex down. And he's like, okay, now tell me what happened. And she's like, well, he got zipped up in a case and we were playing a hide and seek kind of thing. Okay. All of these details are very important, so they should just be able to come out without. It, it should be like he zipped him up. He zipped he zipped himself up in a suitcase, and uh, I came back down, and he was dead in the morning. Like if that were the truth, that's that would easily come out. Instead, it's being clouded with a lot of like kind of thing and and suitcase kind of thing and 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 hide and seek. We were playing. My boyfriend and I were playing kind of thing and. It's not direct. Everything you else know, is direct. The shocking part is direct. The less shocking part, what you would imagine to be less shocking, is not direct, which tells you there's some level of deception there. You know, what's what's amazing to me is that I don't mind breaking this down again because now I know Sarah Boone. The first time yeah. that we did this, I'm just like, I'm giving her all kinds of credit about her, like, you know, uh, being some kind of cunning. Yeah. She's not. Uh, she believes that she's smarter than everyone she encounters. However, she's less smart than everyone she encounters. And that's why we now wind up with the story of my boyfriend and I were playing hide and go seek and he hid in a suitcase and I went to sleep and I forgot about him. That's what she would come to say later when she was in the interview. And, um, you know, I, at this point, Drew, do we even need to keep going with the 911 call? Because he gives her like really. directions for CPR and yeah. the night he, she already found him like 90 minutes ago and has called her ex-husband to come over. I just wanted to play the 911 call to establish the story. So here we know the police show up, they go inside, they find a dead man in a suitcase. They're very nice to her. She wants to go inside and get water out of her place. That's what the main thing I can remember is that she, you know, she's thirsty. They take her down for interrogation. Uh, and, uh, you know, she, she remarks that she intentionally didn't leave him in there, but what's, what's most amazing to me is that, you know, um, in this case, a, a damning piece of evidence came to light that being video from her cell phone, the video on the cell phone is, um, video of the suitcase with, uh, his name's Jorge Torres, right? He's in there going, Sarah. Sarah, I can't breathe. And, she, and she's just like, yeah, just like how I can't breathe when you cheat on me. I can't breathe. That's how it feels when you choke me. Sarah, Sarah, that's my name. Don't wear it out. Sarah. And, and, and she's uh, mocking him as he dies. She has produced her own best evidence against herself. Now, let's go into the court stuff, unless you have anything to add about the interrogation, the great stuff I forgot. No, you know what I was I was contemplating doing though, John, and I, I don't know if you agree to it or not because I could put it together in a couple seconds. But maybe we should just play. We, we didn't play on the original in the original playlist, which I would hope you all would refer to if you're just hearing this episode for the first time. Go back and listen to the other playlists. Like I, I've distilled them down in the audio version. I've distilled it down to its own podcast. They're about 25 minutes a piece. And uh, we, we uh, you know, John, Jonathan uh, succinctly breaks down the 911 call, like delves deep into it, explains what uh, the perspective of 911 dispatcher. We both kind of chime in in the second episode where we talk ab about the body cam and what the reactions are. Um, and then it, it eases a little bit into the interrogation part. And then in the third episode, which is probably more uh, like 45 minutes or an hour, um, I, I kind of break, you know, I just, I rely on my old experiences, uh, teaching interrogated interviews and interrogations. And I kind of show some stuff in there. So I would encourage you to go back and listen to the playlist, what we never did. And it was, it was more than likely me. Um, we never really played the, the footage that was on her phone and that was released after 
I think it was maybe after we did the best. So maybe not. I, I'm, I'm usually not one to play like the gruesome stuff, but I was going to say it's a, it's a little gruesome. So I don't know. It's what we're here for. So it, it's, it's entirely up to you, John. We can, we can by all means go ahead. Yeah. For everything you've done to me. Sarah. For everything you've done to me. Sarah. Thank you. This now infamous video was taken by Sarah Boone herself, showing her boyfriend, 42-year-old George Torres, inside a suitcase. She says they were playing hide and seek when Torres hopped inside. Prosecutors say Torres was begging for his life, telling Boone he couldn't breathe. But you decide for yourself. <laughs> Sarah. You, Sarah. <laughs> Stupid. Sarah. That's my name. Don't wear it up. Sarah, I can't breathe, babe. Seriously. Yeah, that's when you do when you choke me. Sarah. 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 Sarah, I can't breathe, babe. That's on you. Sarah, I can't breathe. <laughs> That's on you. Sarah. Real around some. Might want to give it for it extra. Because <laughs> I got this. Sarah. Real or Sarah. Sarah, I can't, I can't breathe, babe. Oh, that's what Sarah. I feel like when you chewing on me. Sarah. Please. So that's a little gruesome, sure. Uh, that's that's the reality of the case. And It's also uh, uh, darkly hilarious in yeah. some ways like first of all how did the guy get in there this guy must have been very slight of frame but i think just to, to save me from a moment of like sheer uh you know uh trashiness now is a good time to mention that uh intoxication not a legal defense in the state of florida you cannot just say that uh well i was drunk and i didn't know what i was doing she appears to be quite drunk here yeah. Uh, how did she get him to get into the suitcase? How did he consent to that? These are the only, this is the only thing I could think of in terms of her offering a defense is that he consented to getting in there and, um, or that, you know, or that he forced her to drink so that her, her intoxication is not her fault or something. Uh, but uh, what's interesting about this is that, so this is the most damning evidence that you could possibly imagine. You've recorded yourself committing the crime. Showing a uh, cruel indifference to uh, someone you're supposed to love as they die in a terrible and ridiculous fashion. And now Sarah Boone is mad that uh, the internet, that you, me, and everyone else has been commenting on this. She's mad that this has sort of gone out to the public domain. I've been watching a lot of her hearings saying that she's frustrated by, uh, that she doesn't have a card to play uh, in, other, in, in, some, in some cases, saying that she's mad that how much evidence is, is already out there. Uh, state's attorneys, of course, make the point that like, hey, once discovery is complete, you know, this stuff is public property. Like we have a right to know what's going on in the court, what you're being charged with, what the evidence is against you. And uh, her objection is, is that it's devastating to her case. So <laughs> she does. She, she doesn't like that. Uh, all that's going on. And she's had now uh, she's on her ninth attorney. Tenth, if you count her uh, brief stint being pro se going uh, going it alone. But, Drew, um, this has been a circus. Uh I mentioned to you before that I'm a little sad that she does have an attorney representing her at this time, a small, small army of attorneys. We're going to show some stuff from her being in the courtroom, her letter to hire uh, this new guy, James Owens. I have two videos her here of her lawyers quitting on her. Uh, where would you like to start or what are your initial thoughts on, on this? No, I, I, it's a shit I, show. Her, her indignance, like, this is why I say, like, this isn't even a shameless push to get you to go to our playlist. This is why I say you really need to look at her body cam demeanor. Then you need to see her uh, in episode three, her interrogation, just because of how she thinks that 
she can manipulate these two detectives or that she can talk her way out of this or that she's out you know, smarter than the average. She can out Fox everybody. And you know, she's, she has no idea how, how bad this is one. And two, she was, uh, she was claiming that she wasn't that drunk or that she, look, I've been drinking. I wasn't that drunk, but you could hear very clearly that she was sloshed because you could tell the, the differences in her voice one and two, um, she would have had to have been a pretty slosh to forget about him being in that suitcase. And and if anything, it, it would almost be, I know what you're saying about, there's no real defense for that, but at least charge wise, it may have moved from maybe a second degree murder, which it is to make it a non-capital case, by the way, to maybe a uh, culpable negligence or something to that effect. I mean, like it, it's just, um, you know, it's just, it's really bad, damaging behavior, but uh, based on her dumbass conduct is basically what that boils down to. But uh, she's, uh, she's pretty hammered and she probably forgot that she recorded it and the police got her phone the next day or the day of, and they review this. And then you'll see in the interrogation, they even tried to play it for her. And she's like, Oh, I don't think I can watch this. Like yeah. Yeah, no shit, because you, you, you know, unalived somebody. You zip you somebody know, in a suitcase and they ran out of oxygen. I don't even think that it was, I don't think it was unintentional. I think when she went to bed, I think she was satisfied that he was in the suitcase and was content to leave him there all night. I don't believe that she thought that he would die. I think that she thought that someone could just be in a suitcase for eight to 10 hours and just kind of come out of it with a stiff neck or something. Yeah. Um, and that, or that uh, at some point, you know, he would have a, like putting him in that kind of ultimate timeout that he would have a, some kind of reckoning with his bad behavior or poor treatment of her and come out of that uh, somehow in a good mood, you know, which is, he's not a dog. He's not going to come out of there happy to see her. But um, I do have a, a bunch of stuff to show here, here that kind of shows how she's been doing a terrible job. Uh, lots of commentary. Uh, we'll even show you just an extended clip of what it's like seeing her in court when she's pro se. Um, but her ultimate tactic when she was on 911 uh, and in interrogation and now in the court is that really the facts don't matter. If she explains herself well enough and if you understand her, there's no way that you're going to be uh, not on her side. Uh, and that's something that is kind of a constant refrain. And also just nothing ever seems to be her fault is something that, that constantly goes on with her. So lawyer number eight, Patricia Cashman, uh, goes in front of the judge and asks to be uh, let off of the case. Now, court appointed, yeah. Court appointed. She's essentially being held hostage by uh, Sarah Boone. Sarah Boone, who is do doing nothing to help out with her own defense, because Sarah Boone believes that she knows better than the lawyers. She won't cooperate with the lawyers. Uh, she's. Um, I described this as, um, as being your own lawyer and by by reading Wikipedia. She thinks that she can just copy and paste the Bill of Rights and that uh, that that's going to be good enough for her. But uh, Patricia Cashman cited irreconcilable differences, which is normally a phrase that you hear when there's a divorce going on. Uh, Sarah Boone sent a 58 page letter to the judge, and she's been sending quite a few letters uh, complaining about uh, Cashman's snotty attitude and uh, her lies. Correct. She had has walked out of the last two visits when I've tried to review things with her. Just so the court knows, I've spent probably 20 hours, a little bit more, a little bit less, with Miss Finn. She has lots of lists, lots of questions in reviewing the court file. Um, she was distressed previously about having access to her lawyers. I have taken collect phone calls from her that are at my expense. JAC doesn't reimburse you because I think it's important for clients to have access. I have spent- Hang on, please. No one's interrupted you this morning, Ms. Boone. As I said, I've spent over 20 hours going through her questions, going through her lists. Um, when I try to update her with regard to the depositions that I took recently, she opted to exit the jail conference. When I tried to um, 
review some things with regard to discovery as to things I wanted to make sure she was aware of, um, she walked out. She- Something else that you had other than a... So what's happening is, is that Sarah Boone has an idea of how she should be defended. And she is telling these ideas to her lawyer and her lawyer is just like, well, you know, that's not how things work in the criminal justice system. And, uh, you know, we, we really need to uh, go in this direction. We need to do these things. Sarah Boone's mad that uh, this lawyer is not her puppet. She's mad that the, that the lawyer is not just doing every single little thing that she says, which a lot of times is not legally durable. It's a waste of time. It's irrelevant. And uh, so Sarah is uh, upset that her her lawyer's not just uh, doing every little thing. She's also expressed anger at being upset that uh, she's not uh, represented by an attorney who has no other cases on her docket. They're talking to clients all the time. They're constantly having to manage their time, talk to other clients. Uh, with Sarah Boone obviously sitting uh, here for a while with this murder trial going on, she's probably got more cases that are closer to going to trial and stuff that she's got to do and, and other deadlines. Uh, meanwhile, she'll meet with Sarah Boone and uh, it's, I'll have, I'll keep playing it here and have Sarah Boone explain what these meetings are like, but Sarah is going to petition the judge, uh, make a request not to dismiss Patricia Cashman from the case because Sarah Boone does want a lawyer, but she's going to make a special request of the judge. I'll go ahead and let Sarah Boone speak for herself. 58 page submittal or letter. What other information is it that you're seeking to have me take a look at? Um, it's things that I've been working on in the meantime. It's things that she likes to tell me is not necessary, but I know for a fact it is necessary. She likes to, in quotes, put things to rest all the time and constantly tells me I'm not having this conversation with you. So I'm not going to waste my time, and I, being in jail, have supposedly abundant amounts of She's not going to waste my time because she's not going to explain something to me. And I have taken it upon myself to explain it to myself because she refuses to do so. I don't understand. Just wanted to pause here to say, so she says that her lawyer is explaining to her what's necessary and what's not necessary. And Sarah's saying, well, I know better than you. I know what I need and I need you to do this. And uh, she's like, I'm taking it upon myself to educate myself. Uh, she thinks she's smarter than her lawyers, and that is consistently her problem. And what it is that she has against me, I have told her from day one that her snotty attitude was inappropriate, and I try very hard to bear with her and her attitude. I don't know what it is that I'm doing wrong to her, but I feel that her attitude has equal prejudice, which is Okay. Give me an example of, if you could, of items that you believe are important. Ms. Cashman is not giving attention to or dismissing as you may have framed it. Yes, Your Honor. Um, she likes to tell me that I don't like her answers. She's not giving me any answers to this written three pages for the question about why can't she have her mail delivered has nothing to do with the lawyer and everything to do with the jail so she is just dumping everything on on her lawyer what constitutional rights specifically She wants to have a very successful outcome, Drew. Uh, this is just s- strange phrases from her, and we'll, we'll address the very successful outcome. She's oddly optimistic that somehow she's going to come out of this um, 
completely exonerated of any wrongdoing, which uh, does that imply some sort of disconnect? Does she not realize how deeply she is in? And if she is disconnected from reality, Drew, do you think it's just because she has diminished intelligence or do you think she actually uh, is at a diminished capacity level? I just want to know what you think as a cop, not as a lawyer, but as a cop. I think she's too smart for her own good. I think that she's, I think that she thinks that uh, she's actually right and everybody else is wrong, but she's been through 10 lawyers and every single time she's been through a lawyer. Like I went through the list today, um, you know, in, in her court file, basically, which is public record, Orange County, Florida, whatever. Um, they're, they're all, when they all filed the motion to withdraw, it's always pretty much the same thing. Irreconcilable differences ethical concerns so in other words she's she's driving the case so just as a human you know not even a not as an attorney or a cop or just as the outsider the the casual observer of what this lady's all about she just she's too smart for her own good she thinks that for some reason her case is like more important than anybody else's and that it's more, it's different than everybody else's and that, you know, there's just like this gross mistake that she's even in jail in the first place. And and it's not it, like a human being died at her hands and she's got to own up to that. That's just life. Do you think her awareness of, of the, you know, the, the celebrity status of this case being on YouTube and, you know, she's talking about getting correspondence from South Korea. Do you think that feeds into her, her egotistical view of her case being the most important thing? No, she she's, it as, she's using it as fodder. She's saying that, why is it that everybody else in the world gets to know about my case? And I don't, and I, I wish, I wish I could say, I agree with her on that, but I don't because we're all just talking about stuff. She either already knows or, that she's not listening to just like now, like the, the, she just said, you know, all my constitutional rights are being violated. The judge said, okay, well, specifically what violate, what, what constitutional rights are being violated? Well, just that I don't think I'm get, can get a fair trial at this point. Yeah. Like it, it's just like, it's a lot of thinking. It's a lot of feeling and it's almost yeah. no citation of legal precedent or law whatsoever because she's not a lawyer and, but she thinks that she could come into this arena of precedent and procedure and rules of evidence and that she can go toe to toe with these guys or that she can direct these things when that's just not how court works. It doesn't work according to your whims. Uh, it doesn't work according to how you've seen it on TV. And what shocks me is that I've watched a lot of this pro se stuff that she's doing on her own. The prosecutors are not under obligation to do this. The judge is not under obligation to do this, but this is either a tragedy, a travesty of justice or a testament to our courts because they all they play with her with kid gloves. They explain to her like at one point they're talking about how they will have this evident evidence viewing. And she's arguing about where that will take place and how she doesn't want to have it at the courthouse because the Orlando Sentinel is going to be there and another news media agency is going to be there. And uh, she believes that she has the right to privacy and all this. And uh, so she doesn't want the media there. And they're just like, well, you know, this is how we normally do it. And, you know, uh, we can't have it someplace else and still have you be on record about this. And, and so they, they, they bothered to go to great lengths to explain it to her. And then she's just like, well, I don't think that's fair. She keeps going and getting locked into these arguments with the judge. And then the judge is just finally like, well, I've already ruled on this. And she'll go, well, I don't agree with that. And I think that's unfair. And, and he'll just you'll hear him say at various points, if you're watching this case, that's your opinion. And we'll hear actually from the prior judge in the case where he explains to her the role that she plays in her own defense and the role that the attorney plays. I wanted to get to this because she's about to make a special request of the judge in regard to her attorney, Patricia Cashman, who, which, of course, we already know has withdrawn from the case. Here we go. It's just been long and drawn out. And I really thank God, obviously, we're going to give much pleasure to him. And we're going to give me this very unique adventure that I am on. She just described this as an adventure, by the way. Let everyone know who I really am as opposed to the malicious murderer that everyone thinks that I am. I Again, she thinks this is about her image. This is about who she is as a person. It's thoughts and feelings, and that's how she thinks the court should work. 
I don't feel that she can do that properly. I still always, the reason why I'm here is hope, is to hope that she will come in with a gentle, softer side and actually listen to what it is that I'm saying and see the bigger picture other than what the one avenue that she keeps going down. There's other ways to win in more than one way. I, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not saying that I'm trying to remove her. I'm just trying to ask you, please, forgive me when I get asked to you for this. If you could please let her know, please, to just be nice to me. And... Be no nice to me. I, I'm telling you right now, there's no obligation for this, first of all. Second of all, I learned very early on in my law enforcement career, there is a huge difference between what the defendant thinks and what the attorney thinks when they go into court. And it's not the attorney's job to get you off scot-free every single time. It there's is no the, way. She's fucked and she doesn't it, realize that. It's the attorney's job to rigorously defend you to mitigate any punishment that may be coming your way and make sure that all of the processes have been followed to make sure that you have some kind of fair representation. That's it. They don't have to be nice to you. And as a matter of fact, I, you know, I, I, I happen to have been in a situation where I needed an attorney and thank God I had the attorney I had. He happened to be a nice guy. Uh, but he was also uh, just a gentleman and he had a manner about him in the courtroom, which commanded his presence. There are other bulldogs that I could have chosen that I know command a different kind of attention in the courtroom from being a dick or from being a very stern, you know, like brick faced woman or whatever. And that's what you want in an attorney. You, you don't want to push over. You, you can't have that. So she's going in with this guilt or innocence, all or nothing, blah, blah, blah. And the attorney's going in trying to mitigate all of the, 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 you know, trying to just like, hey, look, we can enter reasonable doubt here or we can argue this here or that. But, but what you're telling me to argue, I can't argue. I can't do it in good faith. It's not, you know, even though they're saying that. This isn't what's uh, what's taken place. I mean, uh, uh, those uh, those attorneys that she had gone through, one of them she had for a year, one of them she had for four months, one of them she had for you know a month and change, uh, and and they all end up doing the same thing. Like w one of them wrote, one of them was denied his motion um, to rem be removed. His uh, he was saying um, that. He wanted to withdraw for X, Y, and Z. And the judge is like, no, stick it out. Like, you're going to have to stick it out. That's, you know, what a court appointed, you know, you accept the terms of the case and this is the money you're going to get. And so. Uh, yeah, never, never mind that it's damaging to the rest of their practice that they have to be forced to do this. And only, it's not enough. To, it's not enough that poor Patricia Cashman is forced to do this. She also has to be nice. If I was the judge and I'm not, and he didn't say this in reply, but I would say, do you realize that she's being compelled to do this? She doesn't have to be nice to you. What, how can I compel her to be nice to you? And you need to work with her because you need an attorney and she was appointed to do it. So you need, if you care about your freedom, uh, it's incumbent upon you to put up with as much of this lawyer shit that she wants to throw at you. Trial has been pushed back several times, in part due to the constant withdrawals of attorneys. Judge, the, le the letters that have been coming to your honor, uh, the derogatory berating of my services in this case, uh, I can't effectively represent her. Uh, I, she doesn't trust me. She calls me a, a dud, I think, a buffoon, uh, on and on and on and on. And no one should have to endure that type of uh, derogatory comments and expect to effectively represent someone, especially in a murder case. And the previous judge overseeing her case previously said in court, Boone's attorneys might not be the problem. But one thing I want to caution you about, if this becomes a problem on another court appointed attorney, I'm going to look more closely at what the alleged disputes are. You have a right to a court appointed lawyer. There are certain decisions a defendant gets to make 
in the defense of their case that are absolutely theirs, such as whether they go to trial or not, such as whether they testify or not. But there are many decisions in a case that a lawyer gets to make. And while you certainly have a right to consult with your lawyer and discuss with your lawyer, they don't automatically just do whatever you say. They use their professional judgment and experience and look at the evidence, look at the law, and do the best they can. So that's the judge explaining that, you know, you you get to make major decisions on your case, whether or not you're going to take a plea or not take a plea or you want to take the stand or whatever. But the attorney is going to be doing uh, a lot of heavy lifting for you. And, and they understand, like, when you file a motion, it can't be about six different things and just general complaints and all this. And she's doing things like uh, copying and pasting the Bill of Rights and sending it to these people who don't need to see that. We don't need to, you know, the, the right to bear arms, obviously not relevant in this case. She's wasting a lot of people's time. She's actually using a tried and true uh, lawyering tactic of just slowing the process down with paperwork. Drew, you've probably seen cases where uh, the wheels of justice are brought to a halt because of uh, just inundating uh, the other side with uh, anything that they can file that, you know, that they will file. In some senses, she's doing that. I'm sure it's not intentional. This is what it's like when Sarah Boone is representing herself in court. And uh, Drew, I'm just going to let it play. And because there's so much silences, feel free to just throw in commentary. I've already got uh, a few uh, fun things picked out. They have any position on the matter, and then I'll hear from you, and then uh, the court may be in a position to make a ruling at that time. By the way, the audio is a little rough to begin with. Sorry yes. about that. Blame Court TV. It yes. will get better. So hang in there for a few seconds, everyone. Because at one point, she's just like, you know, um, well, what, we need to have a hearing about this. You know, I'm not prepared. And, and the judge is like, that is this hearing. <laughs> yeah, you're in the hearing. And uh, if you think about it, the idea that a, a woman is on trial for murder and she's abdicated her right to an attorney. Uh, can you you just have to imagine how bad it's been with these attorneys? OK, yes, ma'am. Have a seat back there. Well, wherever you feel most comfortable. I can just sit back there. Whilst okay, thank you. Until you're, until you're ready here. Uh, thank you, ma'am. All right, Ms. Boone, you can proceed, ma'am. First and foremost, I do not know what it is that you are referring to. When you say you do not know what I'm referring to, what do you mean? Um, file, uh, motions were filed by the WFTB and the Orlando Sentinel. Yes, ma'am. So, um, there was a motion for, to intervene for the limited purposes of opposing closure that was filed on August 12th by WFTV. Uh, it was sent to you by U.S. Mail at the, uh, correct inmate legal mail address on August the 12th. And the Orlando Sentinel's motion to intervene and notice of joinder was filed, um, on August 13th. Um, and it reflects, it's, it said the certificate of service was August 13th, and it was sent to you at the same um, legal mail correspondence address at the Orange County Jail. Have you received either of those motions? I have not. Okay, I have copies. I have copies. Oh, perfect. All right. That's she always says she hasn't received anything. So, Ms. Boone, if you'd like to take a look at those, feel free to take your time to review them. And then after you've review, reviewed them, I may have the opportunity to answer any questions you have about them if I can. And then we can uh, we can proceed. See how they're willing to just teach her how to be a lawyer in the middle of the court? She should have already been prepared. She should have already maybe had some remarks written down. At this point, she should be uh, ready to go, making remarks, uh, a rebuttal about why she should make her case. She's sitting there, the courtroom, nothing is happening. Everyone just sitting around. The court says, you know, take your time to review these documents. It's mostly just so she can organize her thoughts. And so now we have the judge uh, checking his email, looking at things that are going on in other cases, uh, trying to see if an Amazon package has been delivered. The clerk, uh, Clearly on Instagram, she's uh, scrolling right now. She's watching. And then the younger clerk clearly watching TikTok as we all sit here. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you see those signs. You do not approach the clerk. They did at one point have to tell Sarah Boone uh, that she's not free to get up and walk around and approach people. Yes, ma'am. Um, one of my attorneys has Topics of discussion, as you know, are the requests in regards to the laptop. 
and internet being one of the most important, would I have had access to that? I would have already had this and not had to sit here unprepared. Um, I believe that is a major violation to my due process of me not having these ants um, to prepare properly and to utilize the court's time and everyone else is here by me having to do this now. So I wanted to put that out to you that I am unprepared for this. I did not know that I had a statement to prepare as everyone else did also prior to being here. Ma'am, you were provided the case law as you had requested at our last hearing. It was mailed to you. You asked for the case law that the court was making reference to. You specifically asked for it. That, that was provided to you. It was mailed to you. Case law? Yes, ma'am. What was the uh, date that it was mailed? August 9. What was provided to you on August 9 was the additional copy of the pro se packet as provided by the Justice Administrative Commission. You were provided a hard copy of that in court mm -hmm. along with <clears throat> the case law that was referenced at the August 9 hearing that the court had said that it had reviewed in anticipation of the hearing that we were having this afternoon. I don't have that. The only thing that I was provided was that there's a provision of witness list um, from the state and then the JAC packet. Those were both provided to you in court. You are correct. The balance of the things that I'm speaking about were mailed to you at the legal mail address on August 9th. Which I have yet to see. Okay. She always thinks that's just going to bail her out of whatever with regard she's to in. This is the first time I'm seeing each one of these documents. I understand that. They were filed August 12th and unfortunately this morning due to an issue with the e-portal. I wouldn't have internet access anyway to receive those. They were sent to you via U.S. mail Did as well. Yesterday? Yes. So I, you're not wasting the court's time. You can feel free to review those at this time. So you could see here, like, uh, moving collating papers. Is this the case law you're referring to? State versus Smith? I believe that those are the circuit court opinions that are referenced in WFTV's motion, which cite to the... Miami Herald versus Lewis decision. This is what it looks like when she's representing herself. She shows up for hearing. She has no idea why she's here. She's making it about how she doesn't have internet access. And they're just like, well, this has nothing to do with that. And she's just like, well, you know, I'd be ready for this if I had the internet access. And they're just like, well, you know, we sent all this stuff to you in the mail. So uh, that's what it, that's what it looks like when she has no attorney. I guarantee you that not only does Sarah want an attorney, that the prosecution wants an attorney, that they have to waste so much time explaining stuff to her. Like uh, you may have seen this document online if you're following the case. Uh, she created uh, this, uh, this little uh, ad for an attorney, which you just have to love. Uh, inmate seeks attorney looking for a prosperous challenge. That kind of applies she's going to pay. Uh, are you ready for your close up on national television? Which by the way, guys, this is handwritten. Uh, it's like calligraphy here and she's using like uh, different fonts and stuff. Show the world who you are with your original creativity, extraordinary expertise and confident ingenuity. Qualifications must include, you would think that here it would say, be a lawyer, a barred attorney in the state of Florida, being trustworthy, honest, uh, passion, passion-driven, open-minded, exceptional problem-solving skills. Like if I record my boyfriend dying, uh, you know, somehow that won't be used against me. Client inclusion at all times, team orientation, collaboration, extreme efficiency in listening. <laughs> your, your listening must be efficient, Drew. Communicating, understanding, dedication to success, presenting a winning mindset. Again, Drew, that's kind of what you were talking about. Like realistically, this is about mitigating damage. It's not necessarily about winning. Capability of excellence and representation, committed uh, maintaining faith in the client, care with ability to think differently. I think Sarah thinks differently. We could all agree on that. 
overcome all circumstances. That's a qual- That's something that ha- you have to have in order to be your attorney. Epic opportunity awaits, she writes in bold print. <laughs> Sarah Boone, number 20005623, Orange County Corrections Department, a vet invest and the oppressed believe. This is the ad she literally put out. I don't know like if like she posted this like um on uh you know had somebody like post this on like light poles around the neighborhood or like how this got out but the the shocking thing about this is that it has worked uh she has now retained the services of james owen who's a guy from further upstate of florida he saw this uh poster he said you know uh it's pretty shocking that you know she no longer has the right to an attorney Anyone who's constitutionally minded would obviously be worried about that. I'm against Sarah Boone, and even I'm worried about that. I feel bad for the prosecutors that they're having to waste so much time. So uh, he goes down there and gets her to sign off on a sheet saying, hey, do you mind if I speak on your behalf to the prosecutor? I want to see kind of what their mindset is. Do they Are they tired of this shit and they also want to leave? Are they ready to plea? But uh, uh, he uh, obviously a plea deal was made. Uh, Owens brought it back to Sarah Boone, and she said, absolutely not. I'm not taking a plea, which... What, what could we imagine? Uh, just say you're guilty and life in prison, right? It's probably something something like that. Uh, but uh, Sarah Boone still believes that even though she made a, a terrible murder and produced the best evidence against her and handled herself properly from the start and got rid of every attorney who was ever appointed to help her, now this guy's going to help her out. So he says that, uh, you know, private sector's got to step up. Uh, he found out about, about the case from watching True Crime Court TV. Uh, he's, uh, he's asked for a continuance because they're changing strategies, uh, but, uh, they're switching gears and they've put a notice saying they're telling the prosecution that they're going to go with the affirmative defense of, um, battered wife syndrome, battered spouse syndrome, battered woman syndrome. We're saying, she's basically going to say, yes, I put him in the suitcase and I killed his ass and uh, made a video of him dying slowly, painfully begging for his life. Uh, but I'm not guilty because of everything that I've been through and so now james owens without a continuance we're going to try to go to trial by october 7th which is just three weeks away owens is uh, recruiting lawyers to his cause uh and is uh not doing this pro bono he thinks that someday sarah will pay him back um so she's been through uh i think nine attorneys now including herself so <laughs> Uh, I think it's 10 with her, yeah, during her pro se era when Sarah Boone was her attorney. I mean, they're they're not going to keep continuing this, though. That's the thing. Like, you know, this guy's like, hey, I'm just coming in at the the, the fourth quarter here. And and they're like, yeah, well. If you're going to come in here, you know what you're getting into. Uh, We're not putting this off anymore. He's saying he at one point uh, petitioned the court saying, I need at least six months to put together this defense because they're going to bring in experts, right? The, the defense attorney says, we need another half year on this. Judge is like, this is nonsense. You knew what you're doing. You're coming on a board for this. Uh, go faster. That's your only option anymore. So I just wish that Sarah Boone was still going to be defending herself because it would be ridiculous. It was fun to watch uh, Darrell Brooks uh, defend himself, the Waukesha Christmas parade driver. Uh, so she she would have been similar because she's, she's got the same disposition that she knows everything or she's just going to be a thorn in everyone's side, but October 7th. Yep. It's coming up. We'll, uh, we'll definitely keep you updated on uh, what goes on after this phase, which is the pretrial phase. Uh, I have the feeling uh, just reading the tea leaves that there'll probably be some kind of plea deal, but if she's not satisfied with anybody's negotiation skills other than her own, then she's uh, and, and, you know, there is something to be said that like when you um, when you go through a court case and it's not proven or it's proven beyond a reasonable doubt that you committed the crime and the sentencing gets in the judge's hands, you, you got to think of the credit you built up with the judge. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that he's going to go beyond the guidelines or but you're either cooperative or you're not. And, and there's a part of the judge that has to evaluate whether, you know, your um taking responsibility for your part in it or not. And, and uh, she hasn't really demonstrated it to this point. She's just, she's like going beyond a rigorous defense. She's in a, she's in a state of denial almost. This case is just uh, absolutely unique. I've never seen anything like this. Follow along on the comcenter.com. We're going to uh, be updating the website uh, frequently. And uh, this in and of itself, the Sarah Boone 
uh, case has its own podcast. If uh, you're into the audio part of this, so this will become part of that uh, podcast. It's also just going to be on the playlist of of our Sarah Boone section, you know, that we have here on, on YouTube. Just follow along. There's going to be a few surprises for you that John and I talked about before the show uh, that y- you may, uh, that, uh, you know, worlds may collide. The Sarah Boone, uh, the writings of Sarah Boone. I, I also want to uh, tap either John or Dewey to see if we can create a, a Sarah Boone font and uh, perhaps sell that. So Sarah, uh, Sarah Boone font. Yeah. For based off of her calligraphy there. So uh, just uh, stay tuned. I think it's going to be a pretty interesting case if it ever gets to try. Thanks so much for everyone who's uh, watching the comm center. We appreciate you guys. Uh, feel better, buddy. That's, that's all I can say.